This week, economist and social policy analyst Bruce Campbell released a book on the tragedy which paints a gripping portrait of the human side of the tragedy, but also what caused it and what needs to be done to prevent such a real disaster from happening again. Bruce Campbell joins me today in the studio. Thanks for coming in. It's very nice to be here with you, Martin. I, I want to say this is, this is quite a book. I have not completely finished it, but I, mean, I was struck, though, by several things in this book. First of all, I mean, it starts in such a gripping way with the, the railway engineer who sets the brake on the train, which is still kilometers away from the town. And he has to leave the train running because that's how you keep the, the air brakes on the train. And he walks away. His bosses say, it's fine, leave yeah. it for tonight. Yeah. And then we know what happened after that. Right. And then you go into a lot of personal stories as well. Yeah. How did you, a lot of CPAC viewers will know you as an economist and as a social policy analyst. How did you get involved in spending years of your life looking at the Lac Megantic disaster? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting, Martin. I, might, I saw, you know, watched it on TV like millions of other people. I, you know, because of my experience, I thought, uh, you know, I could do a kind of an independent analysis. I'd looking, I've been looking at issues of regulation, deregulation, not in the railway sector, but I mm -hmm. figured I could learn. Um, and and so, um, and this was during the summer, so I was on holidays. I got back from my holidays and I learned that my colleague then, my ex-colleague now, lost three members of her family, so the two young girls and their mother. So that kind of put a whole new dimension. Mm. I wrote three reports while I was at uh, CCPA. Uh, and got a Law Foundation grant on the basis of that and spent a year um, at the law faculty of University of Ottawa. So, so I, was, it, I was continuing to do this work and I made relationships with the people in Lac Megantic and then Jim Lorimer said, why don't you put it together mm -hmm. in a book? And this is the result. One of the big questions is, and much has been said about what caused the disaster, but it was a convergence on many, many things and you identify them in their book. I mean, in, in, a, in a nutshell, what caused the disaster? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's hard to put it in a nutshell yeah. because I, I go back to uh, the beginning of this process in 1985 with the introduction of the Railway Safety Act and there are a number of major events or steps in that process bo by both conservative and, and liberal government. Mm -hmm. um, so it was deregulation and it was sort of aided and abetted by austerity, so fiscal austerity uh, and privatization, namely the privatization of CN. And then in 2020, 2001, they brought in something called safety management system, which was a form of industry self-regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, they called it an additional layer, but in fact it was a s substitute. And then, and th there are many other steps, but then mm -hmm. the Harper government came, and uh, the Harper government was very kind of a hardline anti-regulation government. Uh, it brought in uh, um, a regulatory policy that was uh, unlike uh, previous ones in that respect. And all of this time, we're seeing a boom in un unconventional oil by rail. It started in 2009. It was gathering, really gathering steam. Um, and so they brought in something in their policy called the one for one rule, which was uh, any proposed regulation from anybody, any agency, you had to remove one. Mm -hmm. uh, modeled on, on the British example. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, you, you have all of this happening. The probabilities the, the risks were increasing mm -hmm. uh, with all these safety precautions being taken away to the point where in the end it was uh, it was not if but uh, when. but when one of the things I have to ask you because you had a press conference this week uh, yes. with some political actors with some members of the yes. MPs and the question was asked that was five years ago Megantic now where does rail transport of oil stand. Um, it's a pretty astounding figure. I mean, in terms of the growth of oil transported by rail, where is it at now? Yeah, so it was uh, it was growing quickly uh, at the time of Lac Megantic, and it went for a while longer till about the end of 2014, and then, it's, then it tanked for uh, bad comparison, but it, it, uh, it was reduced until, for a couple of years, started, started to move up again in 2017. It hit a record. Uh, in uh, June of 2018, and the estimates for next year are 500,000 barrels per day of oil by rail export volumes. Uh, and that's about three times as much 
as the volume that was happening around the time of Lac Mégantic. So you've got a situation uh, where you know it's passing through communities uh, populated, not so populated, mm -hmm. uh, in in greater and greater amounts. Okay, let's go down in bullet form because I, I, mm. to, to fast forward to your last chapter, you you your last chapter in the book is called Plus ça change. Yes, and that's making reference to plus ça change, plus c'est le même. Yeah. More changes, the more things remain the same. Yeah. It's not a it's not a very optimistic picture you paint. Uh, let's go down in bullet form some of the things you say. You say, one, we still have a government that is committed to deregulating? As, 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 far, as, we can, as far as I can tell, there, this one-for-one one rule that uh, the Harper government uh, brought in, it's still in place. They haven't, re they haven't replaced it. In fact, there are changes that have happened in the recent uh, NAFTA 2.0 that actually integrate uh, uh, regulatory issues m more uh, I actually into the agreement. They weren't okay. into the agreement before. And so there are uh, possibilities for regulatory harmonization. The, the tendency tends to be downward, especially in the era uh, okay. of Trump. And if you got that pushed by the industry as well, uh, that's just one. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you an example. Two weeks ago, I was speaking with Marc Garneau. We did an interview yeah. on this show with Marc Garneau, the transport minister. Mm -hmm. He announced that the, um, the timelines for phasing out mm -hmm. the most dangerous kind of tank cars uh, have been accelerated. Yeah. He talks about the DOT 111. Mm -hmm. uh, we won't get into too much detail, but yeah. one of the t types he says has been already completely phased out for oil transport. Yeah, right. Another type is supposed to be phased out by the end of this year. <clears throat> and then a third type uh, is supposed to be phased out much faster, five years mm -hmm. faster than forecast. Yeah. So the government's saying getting rid of the dangerous tank cars is way ahead of schedule. Yeah. So um, I think one thing you have to note about that is that the what's called the CPC, it's a, it's a modification of mm -hmm. the old DOT 111s, the CPC 1232 jacketed. Right. What he's referring to is the unjacketed version right. that were accelerated. The jacketed version can still carry crude oil until 2025, mm -hmm. uh, until everything is upgraded, either new or upgraded to the what's called the TC117 standard. Right. Even with the retrofitted TC117 standard, we've seen accidents, derailments, and spills. Most recently, in Iowa in, in the spring. So it's not. It's not. Uh, it definitely isn't fail safe. And since a lot of the oil that's being transported is is bitumen from Alberta in diluted form called dilbit. Mm -hmm. um, it's the safest form for dilbit would be raw. Okay. Uh, but what they in dilbit to make it flow, the diluents are are volatile. We saw what happened in Gogama in 2015. That was that was dilbit. We saw what happened in New Brunswick around the same time, a little bit before. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no pressure. To tr there's only a small number of cars that uh, that are specialized with heat coils to allow the the the, the bitumen to flow in raw form, right. and there don't doesn't seem to be any pressure that I can see on the part of the government to have a conversion to that form. Okay. You also in your press conference mentioned that some of the new cars are also spilling. I mean, when when yeah. they involved in accident, they've been spilling. So the new allegedly safe cars. Yeah. The government though also points to other measures. They say that they have brought in better monitoring. They say that they're releasing more information for, to first responders, yeah. that companies have to have emergency plans in place, yeah. uh, that there's new rules about braking, because the brakes yeah. were not working on this train, yeah. new rules yeah. about braking and, and yeah. one-man trains. Those yeah. are all phasing out. Yeah. Well, let's, let's just start with braking and securement. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the TSB has been alarmed. It made it, uh, recommendations as a result of the lac Megantic report that uh, that measure should be taken to improve securement, backup measures, et cetera. And what it found is in the years since uh, the disaster, there's actually been an increase, a significant increase. And Kathy Fox at uh, the fifth anniversary actually warned about that. This is runaway trains. This like is runaway saw. trains. This is uncontrolled movement. Um, and so, you know, so there's, you know, there's still a problem at a time when volumes uh, are increasing. So it, Transport Canada clearly hasn't addressed that. They partially addressed the mm -hmm. question of, of tank cars, but the question of runaways, and especially runaways and spills carrying dangerous goods, is increasing. 
Okay, what about information? Because there's also another issue which comes up, and that is information. Uh, the government's saying that information will be given yeah. to first responders, yeah. but not to the public. Yeah. And they cite the, the, the concerns about terrorism, concerns yeah. about safety. Uh, if you give information about volatile substances being transported, you're opening the door to people abusing that. Yeah, I, I you know, I mean, that's a point well taken, but, uh, but the information isn't being provided uh, unless that's changed recently mm -hmm. uh, in real time. As far as information generally, I know members of the public uh, that are concerned. There are a number of activist groups, Safe Rail Communities in Toronto, for example, uh, tried and tried and tried under access to information just to get the information about the company's risk assessments mm -hmm. of trains going through there and they were unable to get them. This is done by the companies, there's no independent evaluation and it's not accessible to the public. And yeah. so that's, you know, I can tell you my own experience under access to information. I've had, you know, great difficulties. It was supposed yeah. to be information by default and uh, it's hardly that. Two last questions. In your book you tell, a, tell an amazing story about a resident, uh, let me go and seek resident, who was there as late as last year, yes. was still seeing untended trains. Trains that were left, uh, he says, in the same place that the train that eventually got away and, yes. and caused this disaster. Yes, his name is uh, uh, Robert Belfleur, and he's the spokesperson for Les Le Coalition des Citoyens Megantic, and they're mm -hmm. a kind of a citizens watchdog group. Yeah. And, How can uh, that be happening? How can that be happening? I, and that's and that's what he's trying to get answers to, and and those answers haven't been forthcoming. He's been, uh, you know, he's met several times mm -hmm. uh, with with the minister. Uh, he's he's reported those, and he. Uh, he has not uh, got satisfactory answers. And his point, and he was uh, on a panel at the Railway Safety Act Review Commission, he said, look, if this is happening in the place where the most, you know, the, the worst disaster in modern Canadian history happened, what's happening in the rest of Canada? That was his, his, his yeah. warning to the panel. So there is a real, real concern. The window, and I've talked to a number yeah. of experts, uh, mostly anonymously, but s some um, you know, in, in, uh, on, uh, on the record mm -hmm. as saying the window is still open for another like Megantic. So I guess that's the last question. Um, you, you have that cautionary last chapter saying so much still needs to be done. Yeah. Are we any better off now than we were five years ago? How much progress has been made and how much still needs to well, be made? Well, there, there have been uh, a number of measures taken, but I think the, they've been um, they've been modest. modest. Uh, in the wake of it, there was a whole flurry of measures, and certainly the putting an end to one-person crews is a good thing, and there have been another, uh, a number of others. But for me, the fundamental issue is the relationship between the industry and the regulator. Mm -hmm. and, and what I've seen from my research uh, over time is a progressive weakening of the regulator and increased power to, to self-regulate, which is kind of a contradiction in terms. Yeah. And so unless you rebalance that power relationship, and, and many things would go into rebalancing that, uh, which we probably haven't time for today, mm -hmm. but uh, I think to change that relationship and, and, and give more power to the regulator vis-a-vis -vis the industry, like it used to be. Mm -hmm. So that's the path ahead. Well, listen, I, want to, I highly recommend the, the book. I'm going to finish it tonight. Uh, the Lactic Megantic Rail Disaster, Public Betrayal and Justice Denied. Thank you very much for coming it's in. It's nice to be with you, Martin.